Yesterday, we concluded by giving a very simple context in which a thermal spectrum arises. I pointed out that if you have a complex plane wave in a space time and you have an observer who is moving through that uh, space time with constant acceleration, then the power spectrum as perceived by the observer, he will see the wave varying with his proper time in a particular way, it will be exponentially redshifted. And I told you that it is a general theorem that whenever there is an exponential redshift, if you do a power spectrum calculation of that by doing a Fourier transform and take mode square with negative frequencies, that is going to give you a Planck spectrum. Okay. So, this in some sense you might say, yeah, okay, it is an interesting curiosity, but uh, is it really the thermality of the horizon? So, I am going to start giving you rigorous and in fact, first two of them are quite beautiful. Uh, derivations of how the horizon thermality arises in quantum field theory. So, let me begin with the first one. The philosophy behind it is the following. The first one is nice, it is my own work, but it is nice, but it sort of uh, works only in flat space time to some extent. Otherwise, it has to be done in a local, local approximation because there is always a local inertial frame you one can use. You need the explicit form, but on the other hand, it uses the following concept which I have written down here, propagator knows all. The point is the following, we spend enormous amount of time calculating what is the relativistic particle propagator g of x1 comma x2. This is supposed to encode all that you need to know about a quantum field theory in flat space time. And this is a generally covariant object which means that I can write it down in any coordinate system I like. So, if some strange phenomena like thermality of a horizon is taking place, this propagator must contain that information. It is just that we have to extract it out of it and I will show you one way of extracting it. So, what we are going to do, oh, this is the reference, uh, I, I decided to write it up while preparing for these lectures. Second, I am switching signature now to plus minus 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 because I am going to pinch formulas from my Q of T lectures and in Q of T lectures we use that signature. And I am also going to set the acceleration to unity by using suitable units, which means your temperature finally has to appear to be 2 pi, because g over 2 pi or beta has to come out as 2 pi and it is g over 2 pi which is your temperature. So, temperature will be 1 pi 2 pi. The idea is very simple, we already know the propagator and this is generally covariant, it can be written down in any coordinate system. So, suppose you have coordinate charts which are static. Of course, the inertial coordinate chart is static and we also see in Rindler coordinate charts are static. Then if you take two events and the it depends only on the time difference between these two because of staticity, then I can define very nicely an amplitude for propagation between these two spatial events with some energy omega. Throughout the discussion, I am going to keep omega to be positive. When I want negative energies, I will put a minus sign. So, the omega as a symbol stands for a positive definite quantity. So, I know how to compute this quantity. Now, what I want to do is to compare A f omega with A f minus omega and that will tell us whether there is a thermal phenomena going on or not. It is not very difficult to see, but let me just go through illustrating it in a simple context. What one is thinking of is something like that. Suppose there is some horizon surface this is a surface in space, okay, like the surface of a black hole or something like that. And then we, we are sitting here and we are thinking of a particle propagating from here to here. It can come anywhere from inside, but as far as this observer is concerned, this is the limit. So, you might as well think of it as coming from here to here. So, when it is propagating, so in this, uh, when I talk about this A f omega here, there are other coordinates which are all suppressed. I will only concentrate on omega. So, if it is coming from here to here, with the energy omega, remember omega is always positive. If it is coming with an energy omega, this surface is losing. So, the probability for it to lose some energy is going to go as proportional to A f omega mod square. And similarly, the probability for gaining that energy is A f minus omega. Losing energy means that it is emitting, gaining energy means that it is absorbing. So, I can think of the probability for emission divided by probability of absorption and in a thermodynamic context that will be equal to e to the minus beta omega. We do not know whether it is e to the minus beta omega here, so that is why I put a question mark, but this is what we are looking for. 
why is this equal to this? I am sure you have done it somewhere, but just to tell you it is very simple because if you have two level systems separated by omega, the probability of emission depends on how many atoms can emit which is in the number in the upper level and the probability of absorption depends on how many atoms are n down and this is the, uh, this is why the ratio is n up by n down and if there is a temperature, this is the surface from which emission is taking place and absorption is taking place. So, if the surface has some emitters and absorbers, their ratio if it is in some temperature T will be this. You just to remind you, you might have seen this in a different context when Onoda said that the number of absorbers or rather number of things in the down state multiplied by number of photons if it is absorbing photons times some proportionality context should be equal to number of emitters or rather the things which are in the upper state times the probability for it to come down which has a spontaneous emission probability which is proportional to 1 and then n omega. So, you cut out these two and then you take this ratio which is n down by n up which is e to the beta omega plus beta omega because we are doing n down by n up that is equal to 1 plus 1 by n omega. 1 by n omega plus 1. So, you subtract 1 from it and take a reciprocal you get your Planck spectrum. Okay? Of course, we are not assuming about any photons milling around or in fact, I have I am not going to get you thermal spectrum here that is what is nice. I told you that if you have infinite redshift, inf uh, the redshift which is exponentially growing and you do a Fourier transform you get a thermal spectrum, but I want to give you a completely different perspective on it and I want to give you a perspective starting from what we have done quantum field theory. So, I want to emphasize that the propagator knows all, it is the mantra of this first part of the derivation that if I have the standard Feynman propagator, there can be absolutely no physics in flat space time which escapes this propagator. So, it is just that you have to look at it very sharply and extract it out, that is what I am going to do. So, essentially I want to compute this quantity and see what it is. Now, you already have something very peculiar going on if you watch out. The propagator tells you what is the amplitude for it to propagate from only any event to any event. So, suppose you are in an accelerated train and uh, or there is an accelerated observer who is seeing a horizon or a black hole and you are outside. Now, if something is propagating from here to here, I better not get anything funny. I would like to have a f omega equal to a f minus omega there. Okay? It can come in only when there is a horizon intervening something like these two points and I am talking like this. So, somewhere along the line, the propagator should be clever enough to give you this factor when there is a horizon and it should be unity when there is no horizon. The question is how does it get? After all, we know this propagator, where does it come from? So, let us see. So, how do we proceed with mass? You just want to compare these two quantities where a f omega is defined by this Fourier transform. So, the g is known to us and g has an integral representation. If you ignore all the constants etcetera, there is a mass m square and the main thing which you need is the interval between the two events sigma square. We used to write it as x minus y the whole square because we were using Lorentzian coordinates, but this is a completely generally covariant scalar. So, if you know what is sigma square which is the distance between two events x1 and x2, you can write this down and this I, I just put this tau because it is because of stationarity it is only going to depend on tau and all other dependences I do not care because there is of course the spatial part of x 1 and x 2 which is all milling around, but we will just concentrate on tau and so I will suppress all these here and all these here. Okay. So, the first thing which you notice is that if g of tau is g of minus tau, if everything is time reversal symmetric you are not going to get anything these two will be the equal. That is trivial to see because if uh, g of tau is equal to g of minus tau, when I take a to the minus of omega, I am going to flip the sign here and that can be compensated by just changing tau to minus tau, nothing will happen. Therefore, if g of tau is symmetric in time, which is what normally you would have expected, except when there is a horizon intervening, you do not uh, expect anything funny to happen. So, there are two examples of this. The first example of course, is a trivial example. 
So, if there is an observer who is measuring energy or rather he is defining the frequencies with respect to the standard inertial time, then he will be using sigma square to be t square minus this quantity. So, if you plug in that sigma square here which is what normally you would have done, t going to minus t is an invariance and as a result of it I do not have to do any further calculation. There is a slightly more interesting and non trivial example. Suppose you take two points in the right Rindler wedge here itself. There your t is rho sin h of tau, remember my kappa is 1 and x is rho cos h of tau. And I had also introduced another coordinate psi uh, in, the, in the earlier talk just to remind you d s square is going to be in, in today's signature it is going to be rho square d ta square minus d rho square and of course, there are other dimensions here. This is going to be 2 psi d ta square minus d psi square by 2 psi. Psi goes across the horizon, negative values are on that side and the positive values are on this side. Rho is your usual polar kind of a, a coordinate system. We have introduced all these in yesterday's lecture. So, you have these two, plug it into this and you compute this quantity, uh, site forward computation. So, what you will find is that there is some uh, irrelevant constant here which is delta x transverse square, there can be transverse dimensions which I have ignored here and this is the delta x on that. Then this is nothing but just rho 1 square, this is rho 2 square, this has a minus sign here. So, you essentially get a combination like r 1 square plus r 2 square minus 2 r 1 r 2 cosine of theta if you have been doing Euclidean plane 2 vectors and distance between them. Since it is hyperbolic you get cos h. So, you can immediately see that the square of the distance should have this kind of a form. The r r says that both the points are in the right way. Again you find that cos h of tau is an even function of tau. So, the this theorem applies nothing funny is going to happen. So, if you are in this wedge you are not going to get any thermality which is good which is gratifying. Now, let us do the last calculation which is what happens when the two events are separated by a horizon. So, we are in the Euclidean I mean we are in the Lorentzian space time. So, I know all the coordinate systems I can compute these things. So, here I have t. So, this wedge is called the future wedge is just a nomenclature f this is r this is L and this is called P. Okay. We will only concentrate on these two, similar results hold for all other wedges. So, you take one coordinate here and one coordinate here, they need not be in the same line, it is some random coordinates. So, I have T in F minus T in R the whole square minus X in F minus X in R the whole square minus this transverse coordinate square. Now, remember that as long as I am in R, T r is rho r sin h and x r is rho r cos h, but in f I have to flip them. So, there T f will be rho r cos h and in x f will be uh, rho f sin h f f. Okay. So, it is exactly the same there is a flip in these two things which is happening because we are in this region versus this region and that makes all the difference. Now, you go and do this computation. Then you will find first of all there will be a rho f square minus rho r square that did not scare you because the if you write it in terms of xi r it is one of them will have an extra minus sign and that will compensate for that. Then you have a rho f rho r and sin h of tau r minus tau r minus delta x square. Now, first thing is that even though I have used two different coordinate charts in these two places the final sigma square only depends on time difference. If that was not the case I am sunk because in order to do a Fourier transform I do not want to do a Fourier transform of a g in t 1 and t 2 separately or tau 1 and tau 2 separately. Only when there is a time difference I have a natural definition of a particle moving with a given energy from one time to another, but that does come, but that is not a mis deep mystery because you know that the at least in the Euclidean plane you know that what you are talking about is the rotational invariance and that rotational region goes through all the wedges. So, it should translate in some nice form when you come to the Lorentzian and this is what happened. But it is now sin h 
which means that tau going to minus tau is no longer an invariance because there is something else here which is not going to change. So, the overall thing will not change. So, you go and compute the Fourier transform. So, what you have to now do is to take a e to the i omega tau of this future and r this sigma square of tau you have to plug this quantity in some quantity and assign a chapter. This is a doable integral. So, I will let you have fun with it. This happens to be a McDonald function with an imaginary uh, index. Okay. The only thing you need to know about it is that even though it, it has an imaginary index sticking in it, this whole function is real when alpha is real. In the sense that if I take this i to minus i, k does not change. I do not know how many of you deal with McDonald functions every day. Um, let me see, I neither do I. So, it goes something like this. The its integral representation is something like this and I think x to the minus i omega e to the minus some alpha into uh, x plus 1 by x, this is how it goes. Okay, this is k i omega of alpha. Give or take some factors in front. I do not think there is a factor in front. So, if you take complex conjugation, you are flipping the sign of this to plus. But now, suppose you do x going to 1 by x transformation, then you get this back. dx upon x does not change under x going to 1 by x is a logarithm. So, these things will take care of that. When x goes to 1 by x, these two things just go each other, which means that it is, even though it looks like an imaginary quantity, it has only real part, it is pure real. So, then you have an extra factor e to the minus pi omega 2, this when you do the integral you will get it, it, it integrally it is not very difficult, you just have to do one analytic rotation to pure imaginary axis. Where this alpha is given by a positive quantity rho 1 rho 2 upon 2 s. What it means is that if you take this energy amplitude, this is the object, this is just the integral of this sin h factor, there are other things milling around. So, let me just show it to you once again, where is it, it is gone. See, here there is this object and you are Fourier transforming with respect to just this e to the minus i upon 4 s sigma square object, but then you have to put all of them and integrate over s, only then you will get the full propagator. So, you do that and you will find that the this e to the minus pi omega by 2 will come as a constant. Then this k i omega you cannot pull out of the integral because this alpha depends on s. And then there is a function f of s which comes from everything else before which is e to the minus i m square as l 2 square upon 4 as etcetera, etcetera. So, all these things you put in here and this is the result you get. But now you look at a f minus omega. a f minus omega is immediately going to get a flip here. Here the thing is going to happen because k of minus i omega is same as k f omega. So, you find that a f minus omega is this, since it was originally minus and now it has become plus, it is e to the pi omega upon a f omega, that is exactly what we want. So, you find that a f omega square upon a f minus omega square is actually e to the minus 2 pi omega. If you had used all the correct units etcetera, etcetera, you will find that it is 2 pi upon kappa omega. So, this is the cleanest derivation I know in some sense as long as you are sticking with some flat space time etcetera of the fact that uh, propagator knows about horizons. Now, two things which I want to emphasize. First, where did accelerated uh, motion etcetera etcetera went in? That went in because I said I am defining energies with respect to tau. I did Fourier transform. So, I do not care what is going on in this sector at all, I just sit here and I do a Fourier transform of this quantity around that point, that is I see there is a e to the minus i omega this time coordinate and then I call it the omega. So, if I do that I am Fourier transforming with respect to tau. It is somewhat like what we did before, that is you had a plane wave and then we converted it into tau and then we Fourier transformed it. Okay. But of course, here we are doing Ultimately, all of them has to give you the same result mean there has to be something common in that and that is something which we have done. But what is interesting 
is that this is not the only reason you are getting it. To see that when the particle is propagating from here to here also I Fourier transformed with respect to the same tau, I got nothing. So, the fact that you are Fourier transforming, this is the extra bit in this derivation which you did not capture in the plane wave calculation we did yesterday. In the plane wave calculation like there was some discussion and in fact, I think Asim pointed out that you can take any trajectory you like and you can write down how the wave behaves along that trajectory and then you can compute your Fourier transform. Well, you can compute the Fourier transform if it turns out that things depend only on some uh, nice way in that tau, otherwise you can probably do it numerically or whatever and you will get some value. That will not have any thermality or temperature, the spectrum will not have anything to do with any temperature, it will not be Planckian, it will not be Maxwellian or anything, but you will get something. And also if I have some guy who is going around like this, he does not have any horizon. So, what has that result to do with the horizon at all is not clear. But of course, if you do that calculation in the presence of the horizon, because there is a periodicity in the imaginary time, this I mentioned in yesterday's lecture, you do get a thermality and it also goes with an existence of a bifurcate killing horizon, which is the term, a technical term for that in GR. But here, the horizon comes in and hits you right there. You can start saying, oh yes, what is the big deal, we are, we are different, we are in uh, doing a Fourier transform to define the energy in terms of tau. Yes, you are. But you do that for the propagator between two events here, you do not get the effect. So, it is not, this is definitely an ingredient, but this is not the only ingredient. You need to break the time reversal invariance, which is exactly what the horizon does, okay. Once you do that, you get this, yeah. Yes, but that does not come in here. Here there are no plane waves really. But you are decomposing your propagator into plane waves. That is the well, I am actually, okay. I, I would not actually decompose it into plane waves because see the reason I like this derivation is because I do not want to talk about mode functions in Rindler frame, which is the standard party line way of deriving the Rindler effect, okay. But then I have to write down the uh, mode functions in one coordinate system, mode functions in another coordinate system. It seems to break general covariance from day one. Here I am starting with a propagator which is a generally covariant object. The integral curve on any curve or any such thing would have been fine, but I am not taking any observer. I have not touched an observer. I just take the propagator and I say if it is stationary, I can Fourier transform with respect to any time coordinates with respect to which it is stationary. So, the Fourier transform in some sense you can say is an oscillation, but I have not put any plane wave there, I have not put any propagating plane wave. But this time coordinate is the to time. Absolutely, this time coordinate is the Rindler time coordinate, absolutely, no question. But that special time coordinate was used in this red as well and I got nothing. Well, I do not need to talk about the psi coordinate at all because I could have worked everything out with rho. I mean, I just mentioned psi because you find a funny minus rho r square here, but I need not have introduced psi. I could have worked with this L2 that just goes out of the discussion because the L2 square is just hanging around in that extra bits which is here, okay. That never comes into the thing. That I can do with two different coordinate charts. I, I can do that. That is not a problem in a manifold. Exactly. Exactly. But I do not want people to panic with a row 1 square minus row 2 square. I said there is a smooth coordinate charts in which everything will be fine. But that is just a window dressing. So, this is more subtle than uh, what one would have namely thought and that is why I give this as a linearly independent derivation compared to yesterday's, okay. And this is working only because there is a horizon separating the two events. So, you get this and the another reason why this is nice is because I, I first said that oh you need to know the form of the uh, function. We started with this form of the Green's function in order to do all these calculation, this one. This of course is the flat space time Green's function. 
but there is a theorem that if you are in curved space time and you take a locally inertial observer, there is a systematic way of setting up a coordinate system around it called the Riemann normal coordinate system. Then you can try to write this Green's function in terms of what is known as a Schwinger deficit expansion coefficient. The leading order to that happens to be this. So, even in a curved space time, so now let us let me talk about a black hole horizon. So, you have a black hole horizon here and there is an observer hanging around here. So, if I talk about two points, one point here and another point here on two sides of the horizon, it need not be in the same horizontal line somewhere here. Okay. Then as long as I can introduce a coordinate chart in this neighborhood, I can play the same game. I just have to keep it close enough. The only place I run into trouble with that is that when I am integrating over tau, I am integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. That is not quite right because when you go to very large values, then you are going to go outside the domain in which the Riemann normal coordinates is valid. Which means that you are going to do the integral over tau from some minus t to plus t or and most of the contribution has to come from this minus t to plus t, which means you are going to look at high frequency. That is for sufficiently high frequencies, the same result will hold in any curved space time. But that is anyway expected. If you are going to look at frequencies which probe the curvature scale, then Andrew effect will get corrections. Okay? And the corrections will depend on the specific curvature scale. But this tells you without additional expenditure that there is a local validity of the Andrew effect or uh, the, well, I, I think I mentioned in the very first lecture. This entire thing is either called Davis Andrew effect or Andrew effect and uh, the temperature of the horizon is most of the, the accelerated observer, the temperature attributed to a horizon by an accelerated observer is called the Andrew temperature or Davis Andrew temperature. These are the two gentlemen who derived it first. So as far as this discussion is concerned, by taking a sufficiently close enough point to a horizon, you can give it a local description. Fine. Now, I want to switch gears and give you another derivation of the same thing. So, if you want to read more about it, you can look this up in this article. This is an extraordinarily elegant derivation and this is due to T. D. Lee. Okay. Unfortunately, he wrote only one paper in this subject and never followed it up. And this derivation, first of all, it is very general. I will give it in a particular context, but without any extra work, you can generalize it to arbitrary scalar fields which need not be free. You can have interacting systems, some self-coupling of the field, etc. It will work in any dimension and of course, it works for massive fields. My previous derivation also works for massive fields. So, uh, while the plane wave which I took, I took omega of t minus x which means that the frequency omega and the wave vector k were the same, which means we are talking about massless waves, but these derivations work for even massive fields. And this is in some sense complement what I did just now. Just now I told you that ah, you need a horizon. If you cross horizon, something funny happens. If you do not cross horizon, it is all fine. Now I will do this in the Euclidean sector where there is no horizon at all and I will show you that the same result comes up. And then we will have to go back and worry where did the thermality sneak in and we will see that. So, the way it works first, let me give you the derivation in one line and then we will look at the details. What we are going to do is the following. Again, for simplicity, think in terms of 1 plus 1, but as I said, it can be any dimension. So, I have an x and I have the Euclidean time t. These are Euclidean Cartesian coordinates of a Minkowski manifold. Okay? So, you have t and you have x. Now, if you go to the Euclidean polar coordinates, we have done this enough number of times yesterday, then you are going to get Rindler. So, that is an angle here and that angle is i kappa t which is k times t. Small variable t and x refer to Rindler coordinate now and the capital variables x and capital t refers to the Minkowski coordinate. Now, what is going to happen is that suppose that t is equal to 0, I think of a field configuration okay? and I, I want to study its vacuum functional. So, there is a vacuum state and that vacuum state is going to be described in Schrodinger picture 
with the field configuration which is phi r on the right side and phi l on the left side. If I specify what is phi r and what is phi l then I know what the field configuration is. Now I want to write down the ground state. So the ground state in this representation is the vacuum state in terms of phi l and phi r. Long back we derived this I will remind you in a minute in the next transparency that I can do a path integral from this T e equal to 0 to T e equals infinity and on that T e equal to 0 I provide what is the scalar field which is given in terms of phi l and phi r and at infinity I give you 0 and if I do the path integral over Euclidean action because of this minus a then I will get the ground state. So I know what the ground state is. Now interestingly enough you can also write it in a different way. So I am doing a path integral in this half plane. Normally I would have done it by time slicing. I put uh, time slices here and I will just integrate one after the other. But I could have also done the time slice like this and I could have rotated from here to here. That is for any given value I integrate all along here and then I go to the next one integrate all along here and then go to the next one integrate all along there. That is just like integrating here, then integrating here, then integrating here. But if I decide to do it like this, then the boundary conditions change. What I am going to do is now I am using T e as my time variable. So when T e is equal to 0, I am taking phi r and then when I rotate T e to phi, I take phi is equal to phi l. So this is what this path integral is and these are proportional. I mean there is always a measure ratio, so we will just write it as proportional. But what is this? This is just a particle going from phi r to phi l in a time interval 0 to pi. But it is an equivalent Heisenberg picture representation that is phi r to phi l evolved by e to the minus whatever is the Rindler Hamiltonian, whatever is the Hamiltonian for that field, I do not even care what it is, that Hamiltonian with the interval T given by pi by kappa, right. So you have this result which I will now remind you where it comes from once again. You guys are supposed to be revising all the previous one, you are making me put everything up in the uh, website and I am sending you the mail. So I can go rapidly but I will just remind you. So this is, okay, this is the reference to T D Lee, it is a nice paper and if you guys are interested you should look it up. So recall that we had the following expression, Q1 to Q2 in a time interval T1 to T2 is the path integral with the action with the boundary condition Q1 T1 to Q2 T2. And we said that that can be written in terms of the feynman cac formula as phi n phi n star e to the minus e n t. Then we said that if I go Euclidean this i disappears and then if I take very large times and let us assume the ground state energy is 0, normalized to 0. When I do that I can pick up the ground state wave function out of it. So we showed that the ground state wave function is given by a path integral like this in the Euclidean sector which is minus A e with very specific boundary conditions. At t is equal to 0 you have this q which comes in here and at t is equal to infinity the, the we just set phi naught of 0 which is just a constant okay. So there is no q dependent. So this is the result which we had for a particle moving in quantum mechanics. Now you just have to generalize it to a field. Remember I gave you the vacuum functional of the field in the previous lecture, I mean all the tools which we developed we will be using in the, in the next 5 lectures. So the vacuum functional was like the ground state of a harmonic oscillator except that now it is given in terms of the field configuration. So, that vacuum functional, the ground GS stands for ground state, the ground state wave functional in terms of a field configuration in space is given by exactly this is like the ground state wave function, this is the ground state wave functional and here you are path integrating over a Q, here you are path integrating over the fields and this Euclidean action should have the boundary condition that it should start with this phi x at t is equal to 0 and it should go to 0 value at infinity, okay. So this is the result which we want to stare at. What we are going to do is to put this into the Rindler coordinate system and now we are doing polar Rindler, that is perfectly fine because this polar Rindler coordinates cover the entire Euclidean plane. So these are 
in the Euclidean space, it is nice coordinate. There is no issue. It is not that you need one coordinate here, another coordinate here or any such thing. It, is, it covers everything. And this is to remind you of the metric. The metric is psi square, data square and d psi square, etc. So, the ground state wave functional I should give in terms of the configuration at that t is equal to 0 surface. Since I will need that picture again and again, I do not want to go back and forth. Let me try it for you here. So, what we are thinking of is this is phi r, this is phi l, the field configuration here and the field configuration here. This is x, this is the Euclidean time coming from the Cartesian coordinates and this is your uh, g times or kappa times Euclidean Rindler time. Okay, and you are going from here to here. So, the ground state wave functional should be given here and I can integrate forward like this or I can provide the ground state wave functional here and rotate along this. So, that is what is written here from phi r to phi l and at T e equal to 0 that this line when it coincides here T e equal to 0, this is the angular coordinate. So, we are talking about theta equal 0. The configuration is given by, okay, I have given both of them. The, the, one, the configuration is given by some phi l and phi r on this sides and then it goes to 0, 0 on that side. So, this is what we have. That is right. Exactly. I made a mistake here. This should be capital T. Okay. So, here it is capital T and this tau is what is called called the little t. Okay. That figure was drawn at some stage. I pinched the figure. I should have changed that. So, just to avoid the, okay, let me write this correctly here. Is this written correctly here? No. This is tau and I think this is So, let me go over it once again since this could have been confusing. This is the Minkowski time analytically continued. When t is equal to 0, I have to give the wave function here which I give as phi l and phi r. Then I go straight up like that. Then when this t goes to infinity, I want the field to vanish. So, I take phi is equal to 0. This is what I would have written down the ground state wave functional in using just Minkowski coordinate. Then I claim that it is equivalent to taking this polar coordinates and then rotating it around. So, there what happens is that when this k tau e is along this that is when this angle is 0, phi is phi r. Then when I rotate this to pi which is it goes from here to here, it is phi is equal to phi l. Okay, fine. Now, you write the same thing in terms of uh, Heisenberg picture. So, the ground state wave function is given by phi r to phi l in terms of whatever Hamiltonian you have. The beauty of this thing is that I do not have to specify what the Hamiltonian is. So, there is some nice Hamiltonian for the field system which I have also. So, I want to get rid of this uh, proportionality constant. So, that means I want to normalize it. I want this ground state wave function to be normalized. It is just a bit of window reducing, but it makes everything nice. So, you take this phi ground state square and you integrate over phi l and phi r. So, integrate over coordinates after taking mod square. So, when you take this square, you will pick up this quantity which is written here. Then you want to take its complex conjugate. So, when you take complex conjugate phi r and phi l will change and hr is Hermitian, nothing happens to it. So, you get this and then you are going to integrate over phi r and phi l. When you integrate over phi r, these two things will just disappear because it is a complete basis. So, you have a e to the minus 2 pi h r by g between phi l and I am just going to sum over that phi l. So, that I denote as taking the trace. So, this is some object, you take its matrix element in the phi l basis, e put them equal diagonal element and you sum over them because you are path integrating. So, that is the it is just a notation for that quantity as trace. And there is a constant c in front and that c square should come in here. So, this quantity is taken to be c times this. So, that c square into this is equal to 1. So, you know what is c, this is the square root of this quantity. So, we know that it was this. 
with this proportionality constant c here and you get phi l phi r e to the minus p all of them just from here and the c square gives the uh, denominator. So, I have now written down the ground state wave functional for this system the vacuum state. I have in this is the standard honest to God vacuum functional expressed in terms of the left and right configurations of the field and in terms of the Rindler Hamiltonian. Okay. What now we want to do is to say that there is some guy who is going to construct an observable just out of the phi r. Here is where the concept of a Rindler observer or an accelerated observer etcetera comes up. What we are trying to say now again let us go back to Lorentzian to understand this. So, if I have a system like this and you are constructing some observable here which is just evolving from this part nothing in this side is touched. Okay, this is not going to influence it. So, I am just going to take everything which is coming from phi r. So, you have some observable phi r and I want to compute its uh, mean value let us say expectation value. So, the expectation value of this in the vacuum is going to be essentially the ground state ground state psi and psi star with respect to its matrix elements. So, matrix element let us take it to be some phi r 2 on the right side and you put this uh, phi r 2 and phi l phi r 1 on one side and phi r 1 and phi l and you have to sum over phi r 1 phi r 2 and phi l. So, again the same result holds you rewrite these in terms of this object this is a T D Lee's insight he found that this uh, this ground state wave functional which normally you would have put both phi l and phi r as a ket if you write it in terms of the inertial thing you would have written it like this there is a ket which describes which has two labels and describes the vacuum state. What he said was look you could have equally well return it in terms of one ket and one bra, but with the Rindler Hamiltonian coming in between. Once you have that all the calculations simplify. So, you have again uh, this is the matrix element I have written down here. This ground state I am rewriting exactly using this result. 1 factor of pi and phi l and phi r 2 then here again the same thing complex conjugate just flips. So, you have this quantity now you are just summing over the originally in the normalization I had a square root once I have written down two of them that square root goes away and you just have a trace. So, when you are summing over the same magic occurs the phi r 2 and phi r 2 just goes away phi r 1 and phi r 1 goes away this and this combined to give me a e to the minus 2 pi over g h r and then you have phi l summation left that is a trace. So, you get the answer to be trace of some density matrix times O divided by trace of that density matrix and this density matrix is completely thermal this we derived long back. We said that e to the minus beta h is a thermal density matrix and I can read off the beta from it and that beta is 2 pi over g therefore, it has a temperature which is g over 2. So, this is again a derivation which I really love because sheer economy of effort you just start with the path integral let me run over that. So, to emphasize you just take the path integral and you first have the insight that the vacuum states can be written in terms of path integrals. Then you say look this path integral can be written in two different ways I can either think of it as a path integral integrating like this or I can integrate like this that gives me this beautiful relation that instead of putting phi l and phi r inside a cat I can have phi r as a cat and phi l as a bra and with a e to the minus pi over kappa times h r coming in in between evolving it. Once you have got it rest of it is plain sailing okay, and you can work the whole thing out there and you find that and nowhere I assume anything about the form of the action of course, there is some reasonable assumption that it is well bounded and it has bounded from below and I have the path integral well defined etcetera, but I did not say it is a free field the field could have some lambda phi 4 kind of interaction in it 
and I did not say that I am in 1 plus 1 dimension, it could have been 1 plus 3 dimension and it is very, very general and gives you this result. So, this shows that irrespective of it is not that when you are in this wedge and you have some, some yeah, you have some kind of a detector or you are doing some experiment etcetera, you will see thermality and it will happen only for plane waves or for massless waves or for free particles or any such thing. Even an interacting system here will feel this temperature, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, not really. The way the horizon comes up is somewhat more subtle. What happens is that the imaginary coordinate knows about the horizon. This is what I told you yesterday. Uh, let me rephrase that. Suppose I take Minkowski x and I say it is some Rindler uh, rho cos h of let us say tau. As long as I stick to real tau, x is always greater than unity, rho is always positive. But if I change tau to tau plus i pi, which is what I do when I do that rotation, then it is cos h of something plus i pi. So, cos h of that quantity, then cos of pi, that is minus sign, sin of pi will kill and this will go to minus rho cos h of tau. So, when I am doing Euclidean and I do a tau going to tau plus i pi, it knows everything about what is going on in the behind the horizon. That is how it comes in. And this is somewhat subtle in the following sense. We normally think of, well, this is bit advanced, but since you asked, let me tell you, this is advanced for the class. So, if I have the now I am drawing, let us say, imaginary tau and real tau for the Rindler coordinate. What I am doing now is to do this shift. That is, instead of going along real tau, see I have already done the Euclidean rotation, then I am supposed to go along this or whatever. Instead of doing that, I am shifting it by an amount i pi in the imaginary axis. Okay? So, this line and of course, I could have done it with minus i pi as well. right? And this entire band, anything uh, beyond that is just periodic replication. So, when I go from here to the limit, that picks up the information about what is going on behind the horizon. At the point, <laughs> exactly. There is no space, absolutely, absolutely. Okay? So, the way Euclidean plane encodes information about the horizon is very subtle, but it does. And in fact, it does it very well. I mean, in the, so what it tells you, the two derivations I gave, what it tells you is that if you have normal flat space time quantum field theory, described either in terms of propagators or in terms of path integrals properly and you analytically continue to Euclidean plane and you do things properly, you will be able to obtain this result. You never have to write down the, uh, you know, the Rindler modes, do Bogolibo coefficients, etcetera, etcetera. Because the Euclidean way of doing quantum field theory is very powerful. This I explained to you the other day that there is some unreasonable effectiveness in that Euclidean continuation. And that is what comes in again, but mathematically you can understand that, that it picks up things which you cannot pick up in the real term. Okay, fine. Yes. So, this is essentially what we were taking the vacuum functional and let us go back here. This is just the ground state functional and I did this calculation and if you are seeing it for the first time and if your head spins, do not be surprised because you do not know where this came from. So, I want to give you a completely nitty gritty derivation of the same effect, okay? because this will, this is just uh, actually algebraic way of doing this. It is quite a bit of algebra and that will also make you appreciate TD Lee's inside, quite a bit of algebra, but it gets you there. So, what I am going to do is to use this vacuum functional which I derived for you 
in the previous lecture. So, now I am going to do 1 plus 1 Renlow because I want to be able to do all the computations. And now I am going to introduce the Renlow coordinates. This is Honest-to-God Minkowski calculation. I am not going to do Euclidean extension and mystify things or any such thing. This is I am sitting completely in the Minkowski coordinates. So, uh, I again need a different picture. So, what we are going to talk about now is our standard space time evolution. This is Minkowski time and this is the Minkowski space and you have a horizon here and I am looking at this t is equal to 0 surface. Okay. In that t is equal to 0 surface, I am going to introduce coordinate systems in R and L. This is R and this is L, the Rindler coordinates, but that we had already done. There is no surprises, only in F and P you have to flip and things like that. So, here you have e to the kappa x cos h and e to the kappa x sin h and then in the other place you just put a minus sign, okay. that will take care of this. So, these are two different coordinate systems here and here. This is of course, the primordial coordinate system which we obtain by using the radar coordinates of Bondi, this is what you get. Okay. This x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, this x again goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, minus infinity will give you x is equal to 0, this will give you plus infinity. So, it covers this entire range. Similarly, this x covers this entire range and I could have actually put, uh, x, yeah, I have put an x prime and x. Okay. So, this covers both r and l. Now, on t is equal to t is equal to 0, capital T equals small t equal to 0, this is just this surface. I only want to concentrate on that surface. On that surface, we know that this uh, kappa x is going to be, you have put t is equal to 0, so this cos h just goes away. So, kappa times x is going to be e to the k x on one side, this goes away and you have kappa x equal to this, so there has to be a minus sign here, I forgot the minus sign, it is minus e to the kappa x x prime here. So, on that surface, I can rewrite capital X in terms of small x and I am never going to leave that surface. So, I only need that in order to define my vacuum functional. The metric from this transforms to this metric. Okay. Now, let us go and look at uh, what is convenient in 1 plus 1. This we are going to keep uh, coming across again and again. There is a symmetry called conformal invariance which comes up in 1 plus 1 dimension. If you take a massless scalar field which has a dik and a d uh, partial with respect to i and partial with respect to k, this is your usual kinetic energy term multiplied by gik because you are in some either curvilinear coordinates or in curved space time and you have a root minus g. What happens in two dimensions? is that I mentioned in one of the lectures that all two dimensional spaces can be written in a conformally flat form, but in any case the metrics which we are dealing with here are all of the form sum f square minus dt square plus dx square, where these are some coordinates and there is a function in front. So, if you do that, your root minus g g a b, you can easily calculate it, this will turn out to be just 1 1. That is because take 0th component, there is a f square here and I am rising it which makes it 1 by f square and root minus g is just f square, same thing happens for the other. So, this action which I have written down, this is just going for a window dressing, I can throw it away and I can write it in any coordinate system. That means, in inertial coordinate system, I have a dt and dx integral with uh, d phi by dt the whole square minus d phi by dx the whole square. But in Rindler coordinates also, it is integral dt and dx and d this quantity. Yeah. Yeah, that is right. It is minus 1 comma 1 and that will take care of it. So, this quantity, that is why you get this extra minus sign here. Okay. So, I, sh I should have put a minus 1 there. Yeah. Okay. So, the it is essentially eta i k that is the statement eta i k up yeah. So, you have the action which is form invariant under this transformation, 
The reason I am mentioning it is that we are going to do this in black hole space times as well. If the action has the same form, then the equations of motion has the same form. It is just d square phi by dt square minus d square phi by dx square is equal to 0. You can also write it as uh, d square phi of du dv with our retarded and advanced coordinate system. So, the solutions to this is some function of u plus some function of v. You have waves moving in one direction, move waves moving in another direction. So, everything gets simplified when you are doing 1 plus 1. So, you do this, uh, you do this transformation from here to here. And now, what you do is you go back and uh, write down the vacuum functional for which you take this phi of x inertial coordinate system and you uh, Fourier expand it. I am doing everything on t is equal to 0 surface. So, there is no time labels and this q k s are the oscillators sitting on that surface and you have just done a Fourier transform. So, the vacuum functional is just product of all of them. We derived it. I am just reminding you of that. Each one of them has an exponential minus half omega k q k square. You forget the normalization, just call it n and this integral is going to be some modulus of k times q k square. So, you know what it is in terms of these q k's. I want to now write it in terms of the Rindler mode in the sense that the phi at greater than 0, what we have been calling phi r can be expanded in terms of some other oscillators which I have called a k and uh, e to the i k x. Similarly, I could have taken phi at uh, my, uh, x less than 0 and expanded it in terms of b k. Now, I want to write the inertial oscillators in terms of the Rindler oscillator that is just algebra. What you do is that let us take the inertial oscillator q k that is the inverse Fourier transform of this phi of x e to the minus i k x. So, there is an integral going from minus infinity to plus infinity which I can write in the one regime where x is greater than 0 in terms of a k and in the another regime when x is less than 0 in terms of b k plug it in. Plug it in and do one of those integrals out then what you will find is that this can be written in terms of a linear combination of a k and b k. That is exactly what you would have thought because in minus infinity to 0 will contribute a b k from the left side and 0 to infinity would have given you a k and what remains is these two functions. And those functions are also very simple because we are just doing a e to the minus i k x transformation of whatever was the modes there, but those modes were e to the i small k x. So, this is the integral which we have to evaluate. Remember that capital X is an exponential of this small x. So, I told you that there is only one integral you need to evaluate in this entire course. So, this is like an exponential redshift, not quite, but it is like an exponential redshift and you can evaluate it and again you get gamma of i k by kappa and that sine term etcetera. I, I even showed you how to evaluate it in the last class, but you can find it. Now, that is just half the battle. So, you know q k explicitly in terms of a k's and b k's. What you want to do next? is to write down mode q k square which is what was sitting here because the vacuum functional which we wanted was mode q k square. You plug in here this expansion. Okay. So, you will get an a k then a k star b k b k star and then you have to do this integral. So, this is why I said it pages and pages of algebra. So, I am not going to do it for you. You can try it out. These are completely doable integrals. When you do that, you get this answer. You find that the same vacuum functional which in terms of q k s were just Gaussian e to the minus half omega q k square. Now, it is still Gaussian, but it is a correlated Gaussian. There will be an a k square and b k square, but you will also have entanglement between a k star b k and a k b k star. Okay. The a k's are modes on the right and b k's are modes on the left. So, the same vacuum state which was made of disentangled independent oscillators when expressed in terms of q k are now going to the oscillators are going to talk to each other. The a k oscillators and b k oscillators are going to talk to each other. Okay. This is an entangled state so to speak. 
and these two functions p k and q k are elementary functions this is Cossack and Cot. Again already sort of see a thermal density matrix coming up, but up to this point we have not done anything non-trivial we have just rewritten the ground state wave functional of a scalar field in terms of new variables. We have just introduced some variables on the right and some variables on the left and we have rewritten them. But those variables were motivated and in order to compute that variable there was this function f and that function f was obtained by this integral that in turn means that one of these quantities is exponential of the other that involved the coordinate transformation which is the Rindler coordinate transformation that is all we have done. So, you have got this. Now, you play the same game suppose you have an observable and that is observable just depends on a case that is I have an observable built out of the variables in this a k. So, I want its expectation value. So, I have this observable which depends on a k then I have a wave function the ground state wave function which depends on a k and b k and here is also a wave function uh, star it depends on a k and b k and I just have to integrate over all a k's and all b k's. But since the observable is independent of uh, b k's, I can do the integration over b k and write down another quantity. So, that is defined here. You take this psi star just for fun you take a k prime and a b k and you put psi k with a k and b k and you integrate over all b k. That you call the density matrix. Okay, this is the density matrix corresponding to this state. What does it mean? It means that you have sort of integrated out all the modes beyond the horizon that is all the modes which are there on the left side the b case those oscillators you have integrated out. So, once you have got that you have this density matrix and the mean value here is just trace of rho time o any operator. Yes, yes, but when I say this a prime I, I mean that that is correct that is correct absolutely I agree that is right what I am saying is this a prime actually stands for a k prime etcetera etcetera that is right that is right and that is what I am integrating up yeah ok. So, you have this trace of this operator coming out now all that I have to show is that this is thermal density matrix ok. That is yeah is yeah because I have been done uh, I mean there is some kind of a normalization convention which I have done, but essentially it is a density matrix which will go and stick in here. There, there is no trace row in the denominator that is what you are uh, you are referring to that is correct that is correct ok. So, this this density matrix is calculable because I already know what this quantity is I know psi of a k b k. Okay, it has some cosecant this that it has real part and imaginary part and I integrate over all of them. Fortunately, it is decoupled I can do it for one k and then I am done I can just multiply them out. So, you plug this in again and you do this Gaussian integral. So, that is why I said it pages and pages of algebra the main reason I am doing this is to illustrate what T D Lee has achieved so beautifully with just a uh, little bit of uh, computation. But it can be done in a completely detailed way like this you compute this. When you compute this no surprise you end up getting a thermal density matrix. So, you get an expression, but then in an earlier lecture I have derived what is the density matrix for a thermal system that is if I have these are harmonic oscillators. So, if harmonic oscillators are in some temperature T what is the density matrix which was derived very early on that is why I did it at that time. And then you find that it is exactly that with a this is not time anymore this is T is kappa by 2 ok. So, I have not given you the algebraic details and the brave ones among you can try it out it is not simple at least I do not know any simple way of getting the result and you can do the integrals they are all doable, but it requires a few pages of algebra. Therefore, after all that what have we achieved for a 1 plus 1 conformally invariant ma massless scalar field I can explicitly show the result which we originally obtained from path integral for 1 plus d space time for a massive interacting scalar field ok. So, the main idea behind this is that well if you found that uh, very surprising then this sort of should demystify it a bit. 
there is one extra bit which you have got here. I didn't have to do Euclidean. I did everything in Lorentzian space time. So, I just took this t is equal to 0 and I did everything in the Lorentzian space time. It also raises some surprising issues. Suppose I have a coordinate transformation on this line, okay? but that coordinate transformation can be something weird in the other regions. I said that if I have the Rindler coordinate transformation, then it induces a particular coordinate transformation on this line. But as far as the computation goes, I only use the relation between capital X and small x on this line. So, did I really have to do the Rindler coordinate transformation here? Actually not, but the point is that I had assumed that the both the space times are conformally flat. So, I am starting from a space time metric, then I am making a coordinate transformation to another space time which is also conformally flat, otherwise I could not have written down the first line, the two actions being that. And that is where the full transformation goes in. Okay. So, it is not uh, as, as simple as, I mean there are things which has been slipped in, but the computation is entirely in the Lorentzian code. Actually, the Rindler is the only one which will do that because that conformal transformations can be worked out explicitly because it is 1 plus 1. Of course, you can change some t to some function of t or some trivial transformation scaling etc is allowed, otherwise there is the only one which will do that. There is another surprising feature here which also I want to mention. Suppose you have a quantum state here, now we are talking standard quantum field theory. And suppose I want to know what is the quantum state here, okay. You would have thought that this is absolutely trivial. Why is that? Because going from here to here is just a Lorentz boost. So, if I know the quantum state here and if I know how Lorentz generators act on that quantum state, I know what is the quantum state here. It is not dynamical evolution. If you want a quantum state here, I have to dynamically evolve the system. But if I only want a quantum state on this, I do not have to evolve the system, it is kinematics. It is just Lorentz transformation because we are in flat space time. But go back to Rindler time. In Rindler time, this is, this rotation is an evolution in Rindler time which is of course understandable because the Rindler time coordinate is the generator of the boost. So, when you are going up in Rindler time, you are actually doing one boost, another boost, another boost, etc. So, that is true. Therefore, it looks like what is purely kinematics in one frame appears to be dynamics when you do another frame. But then there is one more surprise. Suppose you take e to the minus, now we are doing, I am going to contrast uh, uh, Lorentzian versus Euclidean. Suppose I am going to do e to the minus i tau times h Rindler as my evolution operator, which is evolving things in the Rindler time tau. Rindler time tau, it can only take it here, evolve it, evolve it, evolve it up to this point. Because this line corresponds to tau equals infinity. This is the horizon and that is reached only at tau is equal to infinity. So, this Rindler Hamiltonian it looks like can only evolve the system up to this point. But if you do not have this tau and if you do not have this i and you do the whole thing in the Euclidean, I can do the evolution from this end to that end. This is exactly what I was telling you a little while ago that there is a complex plane tau going to i by going from one point to another point which is pi away, which is like tau going to tau plus i pi allows a completely full evolution. So, again the contra, you do not need this because this derivation is entirely on this plane and I could get you a thermal spec, uh, density matrix. So, that is per perfectly fine and if you have done a Lorentz transformation, I would have got you a density mat thermal density matrix here also, but that is not the issue. But if you are thinking of Rindler Hamiltonian versus the normal Hamiltonian, there is an issue in the evolution in the sense that it evolves things only up to this and what is more it is purely kinematics in one frame which appears like dynamics in another frame. 
I believe there are a few things to be resolved here. So, if you are interested again talk to me, but uh, that is basically it. Okay. Now, I want to spend maybe another 5, 10 minutes because this is I am going to go into another topic. So far we have been doing everything in flat space time and eventually I want to talk to you about black hole evaporation and temperature of black holes and things like that. So, as a preliminary to that I want to talk about static geometries with horizon. This can be done in great generality, but I am going to go in a very general way up to a point and then I am going to make as assumption so that it comes to a tractable point. We are talking about a metric, uh, this part of the course I mean at least a few slides will require some familiarity with GR. Are there people here who do not know GR? Just put up your hand, one then, okay. So, just look at your emails or something for some time. Okay. So, uh, so I am going to assume that people know GR. So, in GR you have a metric which is like this, which is a static metric. What do I mean by that? In my notation x alpha is spatial coordinates. So, there is an n square here which depends only on spatial coordinates, it is independent of time. So, it is static. Then you have a spatial metric which is gamma alpha beta, sometimes I will call it gamma alpha beta, sometimes I will call g alpha beta. Here I am just distinguishing the spatial part with time part and that also depends only on the spatial coordinates and dx alpha dx beta. This takes care of the static geometry part. Now, I want to say there is a horizon. That statement is equivalent to saying that this n square vanishes on some surface and the derivatives of the n are finite and non-zero on that surface. The second condition is actually needed to take away something called extremal horizons, I do not want to talk about them. So, these are these are the honest record horizons you will meet. So, this is uh, this is n square and this is this gamma, this is what describes the metric. Now, you can once you have such a static coordinate system, there is a very natural choice of observers. These are the observers who are just sitting quietly at the coordinate. So, x alpha equals constant is where he is sitting. So, you have the spatial coordinate this is equal to constant and they will have a velocity which is just in time like direction because they are not moving in spatial direction. So, their velocity will be entirely in time like direction and they will have an acceleration. This is what I told you the other day I mean ball dropped to the ground every normal people would have said is accelerating downwards relatives to it say it is not accelerating at all it is in freely falling frame. Ball on the table normal guys would say it is not accelerating the relatives say that it is accelerating because it is accelerating with respect to free fall. So, these is observers are sitting quietly on x is equal to constant, but they have an acceleration and the four acceleration in uh, relativity is defined as uj dj along ui, uj dj is the kind of a vector along that ui and you are asking how ua is changing along that. So, when you compute it for these guys you will have zero component here and only the special components uh, that you should be able to guess because there is a there is a theorem that ui and ai are orthogonal to each other. So, if this has only time component it is uh, reasonable to expect that that time component goes to zero here and you have only special component. So, you can work this out and you will find it is essentially d alpha of n times n. Again just to connect up with things which you know in a weak field limit this n square will turn out to be something like 1 plus 2 phi by c square. So, if you are taking the derivative of that it is like taking the gradient of uh, phi. So, it is like acceleration I mean it is not a very precise statement, but uh, that is how you will get that. Now, you take the unit normal to n is equal to constant surfaces. So, this n is equal to constant surfaces are again special because n is equal to 0 surface is going to give me a horizon. So, think in terms of this n as something like the radial coordinates or rather this function depending only on radial coordinate. So, n is equal to constant is like r is equal to constant in short shell geometry. You can in your back of the mind imagine something like a short shell geometry then it is my 1 minus 2 m by r okay. and there will be something else here. So, if I am saying n is equal to constant surface, I am looking at r is equal to constant surface. So, you can define normal to this n is equal to constant surface, which you can again work out and you will find 
that if this is the n alpha is the unit normal and if I take the acceleration the normal component of the acceleration and you multiply it by capital N that is a nice finite quantity like this n times a because this is a finite quantity this is a finite quantity. This is important because we are going to take n is equal to going to 0 limit when you are getting close to the horizon. When you go close to the horizon this coordinate acceleration will diverge because this is finite and n is going to go to 0 you put the n in the denominator. But this is the correct acceleration to think of and these are called the redshifted acceleration because n is also the redshift factor. So, what we are going to this is exactly the statement here on h this has a finite limit which we call kappa that is the surface gravity. So, whenever you talk about surface gravity of a horizon that is defined by this in any static geometry with the horizon this is sufficiently general definition. There are other ways of defining it in terms of null surface etcetera, but this is good enough for us. Now, I can sort of connect it with Rindler coordinates in the sense that I can use this n itself as a local coordinate. I mean in a very general space, space time you have to ask questions like whether it is a single valued function etcetera, but in any local region I could have gone from this x alpha which are x 1, x 2, x 3 to n being one of the coordinates and two orthogonal coordinates. Again keep short sailed in mind in short sailed your n is like 1 minus 2 m by r. So, n using n as a coordinate is like using r as a coordinate which is a very natural thing to do and then the two other coordinates will be like theta and phi ok that is that is what you should have in the back of your mind. Then you can rewrite the metric in terms of these variables. So, the spatial part will have because you are doing this transformation spatial part will have some complicated uh, off diagonal terms etcetera. But this part which is what we are going to actually look at that will have a minus n square d t square and your n is now a coordinate. So, whatever is the coordinate here and you have this n a the whole square here. So, I think I have written it down here in the near horizon limit this n a the whole square is going to become kappa square and this is becoming minus n square d n square this is like minus rho square d rho square. Okay. So, this is Rindler. So, the near horizon limit of a static space time with a horizon will mimic the Rindler except for this transverse part which we do not care anyway. That is why we spend so much of time studying Rindler coordinate system because any other static geometry. So, this covers everything it covers d sitter in static coordinates, uh, short sailed in uh, static coordinates, Rissner Nostram etcetera in all of them come under this blanket and all of them has a Rindler like coordinate limit when you go close to the horizon. There is also uh, the general statement about the exponential redshift maybe this I will take in the next lecture because uh, we have 10 minutes and I think I would like to spend it on questions ok. So, let us stop here questions. in uh, in which context horizon of course, prevents you from getting communication from one side to the other in in, in radiating a thermal bath. Oh, no, I yes, yes. Well, that is not coming out of horizon that is because this other observer is using a different time coordinate. So, there is a Bogolibo coefficient which defines a new vacuum and new particles. Now, there are two questions here one is if beta is not equal to 0 in a Bogolibo transformation then the A vacuum will contain B particles ok. That part is nothing a priori connected with the horizon. For example, if you are in a time dependent background then there will be a Bogolibo transformation between in state and out state and particles will be produced. The thermality comes essentially from the periodicity and time coordinate which you can again see in this also. So, if you look at this assuming that some kind of a local approximation can be made 
what you will find is that you have when I, if I Euclidean eyes in this time, I am going to get n square dt square and dn square. This is dr square plus r square d theta square. So, you should have periodicity in this imaginary time in order to avoid a singularity at that point and the periodicity in imaginary time will give you thermality. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it will, right. The th thermal bath will disappear because he is coming back to something else. Okay, they were all generated by the guy who was pushing the detector, okay. So, a physical picture is something like this. Suppose you want to think of a detector as a harmonic oscillator with states. So, you take two balls and connect it with a spring. So, quantum mechanically these jiggles are going to come in quantized energy units. Now, if you just keep it somewhere then it will just vibrate it has zero point energy etcetera. Now, I this is my detector, this is my detector for the particles and it is coupling to a field. Now, I want to accelerate this detector. So, what do I do? I take the center of mass and I put an extra potential which will accelerate the center of mass. So, what I am doing is that suppose I have q 1 and q 2 as these coordinates. So, I had originally half m 1 q 1 dot square half m 2 q dot dot square and then the potential energy. Now, I have another now I go to the center of mass coordinates and the reduced coordinates and in the center of mass coordinate if I call it r I have going to put some m g r potential external. Therefore, now if you write come back to the dynamics and ask what happened you will find that you thought that you are just pushing an oscillator, but oscillator has internal degree of freedom. So, part of the energy you are going to give will jiggle it, okay. I am trying to give it to you in a physical way. So, what is happening is that part of the energy you are supplying thinking you are accelerating the detector because the detector has internal degrees of freedom will go into the internal degrees of freedom to excite the detector. So, if I stop uh, accelerating that is not going to happen and that is exactly what is going on. Much later we will actually work out a model for a detector where maybe these questions we can again revisit. But roughly speaking if I have an accelerating detector and it is detecting energy, it is detecting energy with which you can boil milk, then you can ask where did this energy come from. The only source of energy in the problem is the guy who is accelerating that detector part of the energy has to go into this and part of the energy will stay back and you can work this whole thing out. If there is a 1984 paper which I wrote which is actually titled why does the accelerated detector click where this model has been completely worked out. It is a toy model, but it will tell you that the how the energy is conserved and how it is going and various people have worked on it. I mean in the early days when this idea came up there was a lot of confusion as to what is happening and it turns out that these things can be resolved. There are no paradoxes. But you should sharply distinguish between what you get in quantum field theory from what you see in detector. This was already emphasized yesterday that was a conversation me and Asim was having yesterday that you can take a detector put it in some strange trajectory it will click. But it is not going to be a thermal spectrum there is no thermality there is uh, you know there is no horizon etcetera etcetera you do not even need a horizon. So, that is that is a different interesting phenomena by itself and we understand that, but if you do quantum field theory the kind of things which we are talking about here evolution of a quantum state etcetera etcetera or Bogolubo transformation that gives you a completely different way of looking at thermality and uh, in the early days again these two were confused. People thought that one implies the other which it does not. So, the simple example is a rotating detector. Suppose I have a detector which is going around in a circle. So, this detector I mean rotation is mv square by r constant acceleration etcetera and you would have thought that it will detect a thermal spectrum, it does not detect a thermal spectrum. It detects a spectrum, but it does not detect a thermal spectrum. Now, you go and do the quantum field theory and you compute the Bogolubo coefficient. If you do it in a particular way, there, there is some ambiguities in it, but if you do it in a particular way, you will end up showing that the vacuum state remains the same. So, what the detector sees and what the vacuum states and Bogolubo coefficients tell you do not coincide for all kinds of motions of the detector. So, the accelerated case is a very special thing. So, I would prefer to think of it in terms of a quantum field theoretic phenomena 
rather than with this operational idea of a detector detecting. There are also other issues with detector which I will mention when, when we come to that. Any other comment? Yeah. So, this is the TD lease method and then that using the propagator and the plane wave. Ah, okay. Not observer, coordinate system. Right. Correct. Well, uh, oh, you, okay. Then there is a three which you are talking about. Is the three which I discussed today, no. not the one with the plane wave. No, no. Ah, all right. Okay. So, so, so in the last one, I am tracing out the B modes. Yeah. Second one, you have if you go to the Euclidean vector, you have go from right, you evolve from right to left. But in the first one, it seems very different from. That's correct. Uh, so, and, uh, so I don't. Uh, I don't so you are asking, am I tracing out something there? Yeah. No, I am not tracing out something like that. That is exactly why I gave the first one because it complements the other two. See, normally what people say is that there are modes beyond the horizon and you trace out the modes beyond the horizon and you end up getting a thermal density matrix and that is the temperature which you attribute to. I am saying that you do not have to have that kind of a picture. You can actually say that I have a propagator in flat space time. And that propagator describes all the physics there is. Then I can ask, suppose you just give me the propagator and you are extremely smart, can you discover the thermality of the horizon from it? The answer is yes. What you have to do is to first discover the Rindler transformation, then say that I can think in terms of energy emission and energy absorption. And as far as you are doing Fourier transform with respect to that torque coordinate, you will find that energy absorption and emission occurs only when the path crosses the horizon. So, you do not actually need to say anything about tracing out the modes. Because the tracing out the modes can create problems when I want a local definition of Unruh effect. This is why I emphasize that in a local region, if the propagator, is, uh, the propagator depends on two coordinates x1 and x2. If x1 and x2 are close enough, then I would claim that uh, I know what the propagator is. So, if in a local inertial patch with corrections which are under control and I know what the corrections are, I can write down what the propagator is in terms of the so called Schwinger David expansion. Then I can carry on this calculation and I can tell you exactly what the corrections to Unruh effect will be due to the curvature. So, that is a completely different derivation conceptually compared to the other. That is correct. Classically, no, classically nothing goes past it. Quantum mechanically, lots of things go past it. Okay. And even in con normal quantum mechanics, I mean, do not bring in horizon and all that, even in normal quantum mechanics, if I take a light cone and I look at the propagator G of x, comma y where x is here and o is here on this surface, the, the correlations are non-zero. Okay. So, it is just that that pattern of correlations appear differently here, but that is true. The fields commute on space like hypersurface, but the propagator is non-zero on a space like hyper. Right. But this is the conventional one I used. Oh no, that is because you do it in an 1 plus 1 plane and you say that uh, x2, x3, x4 goes to x2 bar, x3 bar, x4, x3 bar, x3 bar. Yes, ok. So, let us ask in two different ways. First, you can take a 1 plus d, take one of the space coordinates and take a plane and do the standard Rindler transformation and there are extra coordinates. These extra coordinates contribute to various things. For example, I, I gave you a result and I said that you know there is a, ok, let me just go back to that right at the beginning. Okay. 
if I want to honestly compute this number, I only wanted to compare it with this, then I got the answer. If I want to compute this number, I have to do this integral. If I have to do this integral, that integral depends on this L2 square. This L2 square in turn depends on all the transverse coordinates. Okay? So, it is not that you can just throw it away. I mean, final results, if you want it in terms of numbers, that will depend on which dimension you are sitting. Now, let me come back to your question about whether there is a genuine 3 plus 1. There is. What is known as a spherical Rindler. So, what you do is that you take minus dt square plus dr square plus r square d omega square and you do exactly the Rindler coordinate system between r and t rather than uh, between x and t. Then the minus dt square plus dr square will give you exactly the standard thing. But r square into d theta square plus sin square theta d phi square, that r will become now a time dependent function. Okay? So, it is something like a pseudo expanding universe because of the coordinate run. People have worked it out. There is thermality in that case as well. Fine. Will it contribute to? Ah, okay. So, will Rindler frame become curved frame? So, one accelerated observer says that I have a system which is, uh, it's my space time is curved. Other guy says, no, 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 it has to be flat. That can't happen. Right? So, when you compute T menu in the Rindler frame, people have done that. This was one of the early confusions which people sorted out. If you, when you compute T menu naively, you get infinity. Expectation value of T menu, if you compute in any sensible quantum state, you get infinity. So, you have to regularize it. If you regularize it in a generally covariant way, that value remains zero. So, in that sense, the, uh, the quantum field theoretic particles, which you see, do not contribute to T menu. This is a bit strange, but it can be worked out because T menu expectation value will transform as a generally covariant object and you can compute it. But if you are talking about detectors, it is a different story. Ah, right, okay. Anything else? Yes. Okay. So, let us meet on Monday.